Ooh. It is way too cold out there to do an opening outside, but we can still stay inside and do some design and analysis of experiments. In this lecture, we'll be going on beyond what we did with multi-factor experiments and consider two new designs. We'll be looking at the balanced incomplete block design, what happens when you can't test every treatment within every block, and we'll be looking at the split plot, which gives us a way of doing a restricted randomization for our factors, because sometimes you can't randomize everything fully, and you have to consider what do you do in that case. So let's take a look at that. And welcome back to yet another lecture of STAT 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today we're going to continue what we were doing with multi-factor experiments. So, so far we've considered the complete randomized block design, we've considered two-way ANOVA, and we've considered the Latin square and various extensions of that, like the Greco-Latin square, the hyper-Greco-Latin square, and so on. Now we're going to go back to the idea of the complete randomized block design, but we're going to modify it a little bit and consider an incomplete block design, because sometimes when you want to test, um, when you want to run an experiment, you may have a blocking factor, but it may not be possible to test every treatment within every single block like we did a few lectures ago. And that's where the idea of an incomplete block design occurs. So this is very common if you have sort of just finite, let's say you have, well, going back to the agricultural examples that are so ubiquitous in design of experiments, if you have just a small plots of land at, say, multiple farms, you may not be able to test every treatment factor, uh, treatment com or a factor combination um, at every single farm. So instead, you'd have to run, say, a balanced incomplete block design to do that. Um, so let's get into that and try to look at some of the uh, mathematical details of what happens when you can't test every treatment in every block. All right, so this is going to be the balanced incomplete block design or to make it simpler the bibd i b d there we are right so the setup is going to be extremely similar to what we've done before um, in this case we're going to have b blocks and uh, if I look at my notation, I'm pretty sure, oh, and K treatments as before. K treatments, I'm going to say as with the CRBD or the complete randomized block design. The balanced incomplete block design should also be randomized, but. Um, I just I guess there's enough acro enough letters in the title already in the acronym that we don't have it in there. Um, but not saying that we're not randomizing, right? We're always always randomizing everything that we can uh, randomize. Um, but the way that this differs from the CRBD is that now what we're going to do is we're going to have two, well, actually three, but we're going to have two new um, terms. We're going to have an R, which is going to be the number of blocks make sure i don't get this backwards right r should be the number of blocks yes the number of blocks each treatment occurs in and we're going to have a k which is the number of treatments in each block. All right, so the idea, right, is that for each block, oh no, not K, sorry, T. T is what I meant, we already used K. So for each block, we only can have T treatments in, in inside of one of those, um, which is going to be some number less than K, otherwise it would be complete and there'd be no point in doing this. Um, and R is going to be the number of blocks where a, the number of blocks that each treatment occurs in. So the idea is that every block has the same number of treatments 
and every treatment occurs in the same number of blocks. So that's where this idea of balance is coming in. But there's one more term that we have to consider, and that is denoted by lambda. So lambda is a little bit harder to um, interpret. Um, what it's going to be is the number of blocks that each pair of treatments occur. So let me write that down. The number of blocks um, for each pair of treatments. So what happens here with lambda is that, right, if you have a block, the block doesn't see every possible treatment, but the thought process is that if two treatments occur in the same block, then they're going to be a little bit easier to um, compare because they're being compared within that same blocking factor. Um, so ideally, every pair, to make this a balanced design, every pair of treatments will occur an equal number of times in different blocks. So if we have, let's say, treatment A and treatment B, um, maybe they occur in block one together, but they don't occur together in block two or block three, but maybe they occur together again in block four. For example, in that case, lambda might be two, which is that there are two blocks in which each pair of treatments occur, um, I guess, exist. Right. It's a little bit confusing, especially when I try to say it out loud. Um, it's probably better if we actually write down an example. So the example I have here is going to be, all right, so the example we're going to have, we're going to have, um, ah, I did switch the notation, sorry. I thought I was doing something slightly wrong. Let me switch this. T, I'm putting it in blue here just to emphasize that I just corrected it. T is the total number of treatments and K is the number of treatments in each block which is slightly different than what I did in the previous lecture where K was the total number of treatments. So I kind of apologize for that confusion. There we go. Now, getting back to the example, what we would have is we would have T is going to be four. So we have four total treatments, A, B, C, D, that we want to test. We're going to have six different blocks to test them in. But the constraint is that we're going to have that, let's see, which one is R? R is going to be three, meaning that each treatment is going to occur in only three of the six blocks. And um, K is going to be two, meaning that only two treatments occur in each block. So what we can do is I can actually write this entire thing out and we can have the blocks one, two, three, four, five and six, and then we can have treatment factors A, or treatment levels, I should say, or factor levels uh, A, B, C, and D. Let me get rid of that and make that better. Um, so what we have here, one way to do a uh, balanced incomplete block design in this case would be to consider the um, basically these values, which using like the standard matrix notation for indexing, I'm going to call 1, 1, 1, 2, we'll say 2, 2, uh, 2, 3. Let's see, we need a, just keep working down the diagonal here, a 3, 3, and a 3, 4, then we're going to have a 4, 1, and a 4, three, uh, then we're going to have a five, two, if I can line that up in the column, good, five, two, uh, five, four, and lastly, a six, one, and a six, no, y sub six, four. So let's stare at this for a second. First, I'm also going to indicate that we don't have anything in these red dots, these are the missing values. You could say they're not exactly missing in the sense of missing data. They were never collected because we can't test all of these in this hypothetical example. 
Uh, so what does that give us? Well, that gives us two um, observations for six blocks. So we have a couple things to note. One is that the total sample size size is going to be 12, which is not 24, where 24 would be the total sample size if we were to do a CRBD or a complete randomized block design. So if we included all of those red dots in our date in our experiment and collected data for that, those values, then we would have just a complete randomized block design as we discussed before. So in this case, typically there would be limitations that would stop you from doing that. Um, often it's because for whatever reason, you can't just test all treatments within each of the blocks, but um, there could be other reasons too, whether it's just we have to reduce our sample size for whatever um, e economic reasons that uh, force us to do so. But the thing to look at in this grid is that it is balanced. And I should also point out here that the fifth parameter, lambda, is going to be one. Um, so what this means, those means a couple things. Well, first of all, we see the, the usual setup, which, which I already mentioned, which is that um, each of the blocks, each of the rows has exactly two observations in it. Each of the columns has exactly three observations. And if you note, every single pair of factors occurs in exactly one of the block. So if I just say A and C, for example, I go down here and find out that, ah, in block number four, it turns out that A and C are tested together. And this really gets to the idea of it being balanced. The point is, is that we want to make sure that we test every pair of treatment the same number of times in the same, I should say, in the same number of blocks. In this case, we just test every pair once. But hypothetically, if we had a bigger design, then what we could do is we could test every pair in two different blocks. Um, at least to my knowledge, they don't usually go higher than that and look for triples and other things. Um, but uh, I guess feasibly, you could presumably consider like the number of times each triple or of uh, factors appears in a, um, um, in a block. But for now, we're just going to do each pair because typically if we want to understand how e the factors differ, we would like to test them within each, uh, the same block. All right, so that's the, um, the, the regular setup. Um, I had some examples. I mean, you can kind of just invent your own, whether it's we have a plot of land and it's just not big enough to test every factor block combination. Um, they talk about in the textbook things like if you have a steel girder and you want to put some type of coating on it, well, there's only so much surface area. It would almost be like if I wanted to do sunscreen on my arm to see, well, okay, which sunscreen is the best? Well, I can only get so much sunscreen up my arm uh, before I run out of surface area to test it on. So anything like that, um, that has like a, an area component to it, topical medications and things like that. Um, also, the idea of judges. So you could have an experimental design in the sense that you could have a certain number of judges um, testing a certain number or um, rating a certain number of foods. So maybe you have your six judges and you have four different types of whatever, ice cream or chili or whatever you want. Um, but you don't want to have every judge eat every type of food because it might just overload them. Now, maybe four types isn't too big, but you can imagine that if you were to scale this up, it may be very infeasible to have one person testing, say, 20 different types of food. They might only be able to test four and then um, have multiple judges so that everything is covered in some way. So these are just examples of where this shows up, but it's a really good tool to be aware of because it is very often in practice that you just don't have the ability to test every single combination of block and treatment factors. But when you're actually doing one of these, you have to set it up very carefully. And you're basically never going to just happen to accidentally have a balanced incomplete block design. They're actually super annoying to set up because there are a lot of restrictions to make sure that it's actually balanced. And the balance well, I'll get to that in a minute, but the balance is important because it means we'll be able to test our factors 
our, our treatment factor and our block factor um, independently of each other. They'll be orthogonal in some way. If it's not balanced, then you run into more problems with dependencies among your hypothesis tests, um, and you could feasibly get some erroneous results. Um, there are more people who have thought about that because sometimes you just also can't have a balanced design. But um, yeah, the, ideally, we would have something like this. So anyway, the idea is that there's a lot of different um, restrictions. Let's put that back in black there. Restrictions for BIBDs. Um, so the first one is basically the total sample size. There's two ways to count the total sample size, and that's the number of blocks times the number of treatments per block, or equivalent, equivalently, the uh, number of treatments times the number of blocks where each treatment occurs. And this is both going to equal, so we'll say capital N, which is my standard go-to variable for the uh, total sample size. In fact, when I was working on your assignment number two, it was kind of a pain. I was trying to figure out, now how in the world do I generate another um, similarly sized but different incomplete um, block design? And it took me multiple tries just to get it right. So um, because there's a lot of restrictions involved. The second restriction is harder to interpret in words. It's R K minus one times k minus 1 has to be lambda times t minus 1. So I don't have a very good, um, let's say, qualitative way of explaining why this should be true. Um, it's just a different way of counting all the combinations here. Um, yeah, I guess there's some ways you could try to imagine what's going on here. Um, but effectively, it brings a lambda into the mix. And there's some interesting properties and things that occur when lambda is equal to one or lambda is equal to two. Um, they were things I used last year in um, a previous written assignment, but I'm not using this year. So maybe we'll go into those in a, in a side lecture just for fun. So those are the two big um, uh, equality, equality constraints. But then there are also some other inequalities that we need to satisfy. So for example, we need more treatments than the number of treatments tested per block. So that, that makes sense, right? Otherwise, well, K can't be bigger than T. And if it's equal to T, then I guess we're back in a um, complete. Ah, actually, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be a complete randomized. No, if K is equal, no, if, yeah, then of course. If K is equal to T, then B is equal to R, and we're just in a complete randomized block design. So yeah, that would be uninteresting, or at least it would be less interesting because we'd be back in a simpler design setting. Um, R has to be bigger than lambda. Why is that? Well, R is the number of times a treatment occurs in the number of blocks in which a treatment occurs. Lambda is the number of times that a pair of treatment, the number of blocks in which a pair of treatment occurs. Um, so the idea being that you, if if a pair is occurring in a block, then the individual treatment is also occurring in that block. Um, so we need that to be true. Uh, we need B, of course, to be greater than R, which just means the total number of blocks is more than the blocks in which a given treatment occurs. Um, and if you combine some of these, you get some other results like R times K has to be greater than lambda times T and so on. But the, um, the qualitative takeaway from all of this is that it takes some effort to actually design one of these. And there's going to be a lot of restrictions on you can't just go in and say, Okay, I have this many blocks, this many treatments, let's do a, a balanced incomplete block design. No, it might not even work because of the way the numbers multiply together. Um, so you do have to be, um, it does take a, uh, some thought to put one of these things together. But at least um, mathematically, it's going to look the same when we plug it into R as a um, complete randomized block design. So the model that we end up getting out here, it's going to look 
effectively the same thing I wrote a couple lectures ago on the complete randomized block design. We have a beta i, which is my ith block. We have a tau j, which is going to be my jth treatment. And then epsilon ij is going to be our random noise. What changes now is the way the sum of squares look and the way the, um, uh, the degrees of freedom are. So once again, each of these terms is going to turn into a sum of squares. We're going to have a block sum of squares. We're going to have a treatment sum of squares. Uh, and we're going to have an error sum of squares. And of course, we'll have a total sum of squares at the end. Now, what happens, right, is that for the... Um, yeah, so for the block sum of squares, the way we analyze this, right, is that we're going to end up with, um, let me double check to make sure, yeah, of course. We're, so the degrees of freedom is still going to be the same as it was before in the sense that it's the number of blocks minus one. And for the treatment sum of squares, it's going to be the number of treatments minus one because we still have to estimate means, category means for all B blocks and all T treatments even though they don't all occur in every possible um, ordering. But then what happens to the air sum of squares? Well, remember the air sum of squares should look something like capital N minus one, which is the degrees of freedom for the total sum of squares. And then we have to subtract the, the degrees of freedom for the other two factors from that. So it's gonna look something like this. But remember, the total sample size is not B times T. It's going to be B times K or equivalently uh, T times R. But we can write BK. So here we have BK um, minus B minus T. And then we get a plus one because of the way the minus ones and plus ones add up together. Um, so this degree of freedom the degrees of freedom is going to be slightly different. It's going to be reduced because this guy here is not B times T like it would have been in the complete randomized block design. Okay, so now we can also write down the, um, we can also write down the sum of squares equations these are, again, I think the degrees of freedom are perhaps the most useful because it's good to know what they are, especially when you're trying to run one of these designs in a, in a stats package like R. Um, but it is good to just write down what the degree, what the um, sum of squares are as well. The block sum of squares is going to look very similar to what it was before, except that now I'm going to sum over all the blocks, I from 1 to B, but I'm not going to multiply by t the number of treatments. I'm going to multiply by k the number of times a uh, the number of uh, times a treatment. Or wait, oh, I always get that backwards. The number of treatments that occurs in each block. Yeah, saying it out loud can be uh, quite tricky, right? Number of blocks in a treatment, or number of treatments in a block, or whatever. Um, but yeah, anyway, we're summing over all of the blocks now, and we can still consider y i bar dot minus y bar dot dot um, squared. Now, the equation for the treatment sum of squares starts to look a little bit stranger. Um, in this case, we're still going to get a k, um, and we're going to be summing j from 1 to t. And now we're going to have a term that we're going to denote q squared j and we're going to actually divide this whole thing by lambda t where we'll say q j and don't don't worry about memorizing any of this stuff we don't want you to do that um but it is good just to kind of see what the equations look like i do i feel like it's important to look at them but not important to necessarily go through all the headache of trying to remember exactly what they are. Um, anyway, this equation is going to look something like this, where we have y bar i dot times an indicator function that 
why IJ exists. Something, wow, like that. Um, okay, so what in the world is this sum of squares? Well, okay, we have a lot of terms flying around here because we actually have an R squared inside the Q and then we're dividing by lambda T, we're multiplying by K. So we can go back up to our, um, our equalities and inequalities above to try to make some sense of this, but moreover, what it's just roughly what's going on here, right, is if we look at this sum, what we're saying is that QJ is going to be just the mean Y bar J, okay? And instead of subtracting the global mean, what we're going to be doing is subtracting the means where um, we're subtracting the means y bar i where j factor j was tested in block i. So that's kind of what this crazy thing over here is saying. It's saying factor uh, j tested in block i. So the way that it calculates the mean is slightly, the global mean is slightly different. You're only averaging those terms where the, um, where factor J is actually tested within block I. So the equation, the calculation becomes slightly more complex and it's worth sort of just looking at that so we understand what's going on. Um, and then the air sum of squares is, well, there's nothing profound about that. The error sum of squares, I'll write it in blue so it doesn't get lost in here. It's just going to be our total sum of squares minus the block sum of squares minus the um, treatment sum of squares. So that's the easiest way to write it because there's no nice closed form way, uh, at least to my knowledge, when you combine these crazy sums of squares together to try to make it look nice like it does in the other examples. So in this case, yeah, that's more or less it, right? We would just plug our data in. We would have new degrees of freedom, new sums of squares. Um, but ultimately, we're going to still do the same thing. We'll say then F test and say Tukey test. Tukey post hoc test, um, HSD on a significant differences, if I recall correctly. Um, so in that case, that's how we sort of just go forward with this. Um, so what I'll do is I will write down a quick example from my notes um, just to give, actually, I'll just copy that over. But when I copy it, I'm probably going to end up screwing up my recording. So we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to copy over um, that example. We'll do that. And then we'll move on to the split plot design, which is going to be a way to do nesting. So we'll be back in uh, one second. And we're back. And now we're going to do a quick example here. So this example was the one that I did earlier in the course. It was just some hypothetical data that I generated where what we would have is we would have sort of a block factor, a treatment factor, um, and um, consider a re considered originally as a complete randomized block design. But in this case, what I basically did was just delete a bunch of observations from the table and then I can run it again. So what we see here uh, is, let's see, switch the color. Um, so what we see here is um, the kind of the setup from before. Um, what I should say is I should actually write down all these terms. So we're going to have six blocks and we're going to have four treatments. Um, and our residuals, though, is only going to have three degrees of freedom, right? Because what we end up with is that um, instead of having, what would it be? 24 minus 6 minus 4 plus 1, we would have something like 12 minus 6 minus 4 plus 1, um, which is only going to give me three degrees of freedom left for the residuals. All right, so that um, effectively, yeah, so you can almost, you could test a balanced incomplete block design by throwing out some of your data in a complete randomized block design. And 
here, what we have is we still are able to detect kind of a weak significance um, in our treatment factor. Now, I'm not going to go copy the other one over because, again, I have to go find it again. But if you go back in the previous lectures or in my notes, when we ran this with the entire 24 data points, double the data, complete randomized block design, we had a more significant p-value. That is, we would have rejected it at a... Um, um, at a at a lower level um so for example if i'm running this test at like a five um with a level of five percent or test size of five percent i wouldn't reject the that there's any significant differences in my treatment um though if i were to see something like six and a half percent it might tell me ah there might be something going on here i don't have enough evidence to really identify it so i better maybe do a follow-up experiment maybe replicate or maybe test the other 12 observations in the block design that I didn't have a chance to test during my first run of this experiment. Um, the block term here is still quite significant, even at like the 1% level or, you know, and getting below that. So, um, yeah, so we basically we have that. Um, but what I kind of say here in the text that I wanted to point out is that the blocking becomes almost even more important um, when the sample size is small. And what I mean by that is that if we ignore the blocking, so down here, we ignore the blocking factor and see what happens. Well, what happens is we now detect no significance whatsoever. So this is very much not significant by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so if we were to ignore the blocking factor and just test this data without it, we would have something that is very much not significant. But by including the blocking factor, we remove a very large sum of squares, that is 19.122 or whatever, from our residuals. Now there is one other thing kind of interesting to note here, and that's that when we did the complete randomized block design, um, the sum of squares for the treatment would not change whether or not we included the block factor. Whereas here, the treatment sum of squares is now a different value. Oops. So again, different things are happening here um, because of the fact that we're in an incomplete block design. Um, but ultimately, the same intuition is kind of the same with respect to the blocking factor. If the block is significant, then it's good to account for it because it will help reduce the variability and give us more power to hopefully reject the null hypothesis that our treatment is or none of our treatment levels differ from each other because ultimately, even though this is fake data I made up, that's ultimately the goal would be to... Uh, get a significant p-value for the treatment factor. All right, so that's the wrap-up for the balanced incomplete block design. Now we're going to get into the first example of nesting factors, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in different contexts, but the next thing we're going to do is, well, start a, another section, which is the split plot design. All right, so the split plot design is another type of restricted design, right? When we did balanced incomplete block design, we said, okay, I want to test every possible combination, but I just can't do it for some reason. So we're going to test some number of combinations in a balanced way in order to still have nice properties and be uh, for our design. The split plot is similar um, in the sense, similar in a spiritual sense, in the sense that there's another restriction. In this case, though, the restriction is how we change the factor levels, because the, 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 guiding, the guiding intuition is that sometimes it's hard to change a factor's level. That's it. Make that look better. Level. Um, so 
For example, sometimes when you apply a factor, you have to apply it in a larger um, in a uh, larger scale setting. So um, the classic and why it's called a split plot is because you're actually literally taking your big plot of land and you're splitting it in half. And maybe let's say you want to apply some type of pesticides via crop duster. Well, you might not be able to apply that to a very small amount of land, right? Because you're in an airplane, you're just throwing tons of chemicals down on your on your um, plot. You might have to only do that in large sections, so you can't finally randomize it like you would like to. Um, similarly, uh, sometimes it's just annoying to have to change a factor. So for example, if you're doing um, an experiment at different temperatures, it might take a very long time to change the temperature in the room. Um, so if that's the case, you might want to randomly select one temperature, do all of your other factors and test all of your experiments, then change the um, temperature, then do everything again, um, rather than the complete randomized setting where we would do every possible factor combination in a random order. So this is a type of restricted randomization. Generally, it's for convenience purposes um, because testing everything, um, again, testing everything in a random order might be really annoying. Um, so the way we're going to set this up is we need two treatments uh, and we're going to need, I think, a replication somewhere in there. Yes. So the setup. And of course, you can complicate this a lot with more treatments. But for now, we're just going to consider two treatments, the one that's hard to randomize and the one that's easy to randomize. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, let's say, two experimental factors, like in a two-way ANOVA. Two experimental factors. Uh, I think I call them A and B. <laughs> a and B. Um, and then we're going to need, I believe, a replication factor. Let me double check to make sure that that's in here. Yes. Yeah, and we're going to want to replicate this. Replicated N times. Okay, and what else do we need? Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to write down our um, model. So if we did this as a, well, let's just do the two-way ANOVA first. So if we were to do a two-way ANOVA in blue here, just as a side note, what our model would look like would look something like YIJ, I think IJ, L because I'm replicating this. YIJL is going to be global mean mu, alpha I, beta J, interaction term, alpha beta IJ, and air term IJL. But in our case, what's going to happen is we're going to run into some um, Trouble. So first we need a replication term, and I'm, I should say the replication term is going to be tau, but I'll write out the model completely, uh, and then we'll look at this. So for the split plot, what we have is we include a replication term, which is going to be tau L. Um, so in some sense, that term exists in the two-way ANOVA. It's just kind of absorbed into epsilon. So this will make a little bit more sense, hopefully, as I explain the split plot. But um, there is still a replication factor kind of within two-way ANOVA. I just didn't write it down explicitly. Um, you could, if you wanted to, include it in the model because sometimes uh, you, know, you might want to include the replication term within the model. Um, for the split plot, what we're going to do is we're going to write out every possible term and interaction term. 
in our model. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say y i j l is going to be well mu. Then we're going to have an alpha i, a beta j, and then I'm going to use tau as I use in my notes, even though I know I was using tau for the treatment before. So apologies for that. Um, in this case, tau is going to be our replication factor, um, tau l. Then we're going to have all two-way interactions, um, which is alpha beta, al alpha tau, um, I l beta tau, uh, j l, and the three-way term alpha not plus, beta, tau, i, j, l. And the key thing to note here, note no epsilon um, because epsilon is actually going to be coming from these replication terms because in this case, because all DOFs are taken so when we write out all possible interaction terms, we've used up every possible degree of freedom there. There is nothing left for like a random error term, but the random errors are going to come from our replication, our towels. Um, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to write all of these terms in a grid to hopefully make a little bit more sense about what's going on here. Um, so the, the, the note idea is that we have a whole plot and a subplot. The whole plot is going to be um, randomized first. And this is going to correspond to factor A, just in our example. Of course, it's all without loss of generality. We could start with B, but A is going to be randomized first. And then we're going to have, this is randomized within each level of A. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to take factor A and we're going to randomize it. So we're going to test its levels in a random order. And then once we select the first one to test, then we're going to go into the subplot and we're going to randomize B um, and test every possible B within the first A. So the, the testing setup, I should probably have saved this equation for a little bit later because it's probably better to explain um, in words, what's going on? So the the um, the the testing goes like this. It would be pick, let's say, I know some alpha i, um, then test all beta one through beta. I guess, I think I used K2 or something um, here to indicate the number of, uh, or maybe KB or something just to, yeah, KB to indicate the number of factor levels for factor B. And then we'll say then pick new alpha and Sort of continue to test all possible levels. So that's kind of the rough outline of what we're doing. We're going to randomly pick an A and then we're going to test all Bs. Then we're going to randomly pick a new A and then we're going to randomly test all Bs again. Um, so the idea is that here A is, we'll say, coarsely randomized and B is finely randomized. What this means is that we have to set up the equation in R or whatever stats package you're using very carefully because if you just look at the data, there's no way to tell how it was collected. It's just going to look like a two-way ANOVA data set. But because we have this um, 
split plot setting, we know that we actually have to test A and B differently. And ultimately what's going to happen is we'll have more statistical power to detect um, significance in B because we're finally randomizing it and less statistical power on, you know, typically to detect differences in A because we're not as finely randomizing A. But the reason we would do this is because we can't highly randomize A either because it's impractical or impossible. Anyway, and I'll, I'll we'll do an example of this at the end, so hopefully that will also make this a little bit clearer. Um, but what I wanted to do was go back to this equation up here and put all of the terms into a nice big table. So again, we have the idea of the whole and the sub plots. Um, but what we also have is we have that certain terms are going to be fixed effects and the replication based terms are going to be random effects. Because when we, you can think of this as like when I rerun my experiment, I'm just getting a new, some new random noise that's going to come into the that's going to come into the data collection based on all the other things going on while I'm collecting my data um, that I'm not accounting for in factors A and B. Um, so what that means is that, let's complete this grid here. What that means is that for fixed, I'm going to have at the whole plot level my alpha i, um, and at the subplot level I'm going to have beta j, and alpha beta ij. So the interaction term is still tested at the subplot level because it's, it's the interaction, it has beta in it. Um, but alpha on itself is only tested coarsely at the whole plot level. Now the random effects are going to be, well I'm going to have a random replication effect tau l and I'm going to have a random, um, I guess, alpha replication interaction i l uh, meanwhile i have beta tau down here j l and i have the three-way interaction term alpha beta tau i j l and the random effects are going to become the um, epsilons for testing purposes and what I mean by that is that we're going to include, well, let's see, what's the best way to do this? I guess what we can do is we'll write out all the degrees of freedom first, like I do in the notes, um, in my lecture notes, and then we'll combine them. So let's try to get these all together. What we're going to have is we're going to have a, well, we'll have mu in there too. All the terms in the model. We have mu. We have alpha, we have beta, we have alpha beta. Then we're going to have, um, oh, I should put towel in there first just to keep all the, yeah. And then we have, let's say alpha beta. We have beta or alpha tau to try to keep the ordering that I had before. Alpha tau, beta tau. And lastly, alpha, or, um, alpha, beta, tau. And if we look at the degrees of freedom that go with each of these, well, the mean, the global mean is going to have one. Alpha is going to have Ka minus one. Beta is going to have Kb minus one. And we're going to assume that we replicate this little n times. Uh, so I'm going to have little n minus one for tau. Um, now for the interaction terms, we just multiply these um, the degrees of freedom for alpha, beta, and tau together. So for alpha, beta, we get Ka minus 1, Kb minus 1. For alpha, tau, we have Ka minus 1, um, N minus 1. Then we have Kb minus 1, K Oh no, n minus one, almost there. And lastly, we're going to have the triple product, Ka minus one, Kb minus one, and n minus one. 
And if I were to sum all of these numbers up, what I should get if I didn't make any mistakes, which I'm pretty sure I didn't, Ka n times Ka times Kb, which is equal to capital N, the total sample size. All right, down there at the bottom. Um, so when we have all of these, what we're going to do is we're going to combine some of them to get different air terms epsilon for testing at the whole plot and for testing at the subplot. That's what I had in green when I pointed epsilon up here um, towards the um, right-hand column of that, um, that grid. So our alpha tau here is going to become the epsilon for the whole plot. And this is going to be indexed by I and L. Meanwhile, these two terms become the epsilon, that is the errors or the error sum of squares that we're going to be used to test for the subplot. And this is I, J, L. So here what we basically have is, um, well, right, these things are going to then translate if we kind of continue onward to having a sum of squares, an error sum of squares for the whole plot and an error sum of squares for the subplot. And this is where testing here differs from testing in two-way ANOVA. We have different error sums of squares for different factors. So A at the whole plot is tested with the whole plot sum of squares. B and the interaction term are tested at the subplot level with the subplot sum of squares. All right, so um, yeah, and then I think the rest of this is uh, the rest of everything I had in my lecture notes are really just saying that we still have to do all the same things that we would have done previously. So for example, I'm not going to write them all out because it's not really worth noting. Um, I'm just going to write don't. Actually, let's put that in blue. And then basically, I'll say with this setup, we'll say proceed as usual usual in the sense that we would, you know, have a, you know, have a constraint or a contrast, 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 <laughs> have a contrast, do some F tests, do some maybe two key tests, etc. Um, so ultimately, the same. we're going to be doing the exact same thing as before, but um, what's going to happen here is that we're going to get a slightly different sum of squares table, um, which is going to kind of be like these degrees of freedom that I wrote here. But I'm going to write it again just so we're clear on what the sum of squares should look like. So the ANOVA table that we get out is going to have a couple different subtables within it. The first thing we're going to get is we're going to get an, well, a replication. Well, I'm going to call it SS rep, which is the replication sum of squares. This is going to have degrees of freedom n minus one. And typically, we're not going to actually, well, in this case, we wouldn't be able to test it because we wouldn't have any. Um, it's really just a random effect that when we rerun, the um, again, we're not interested so much in testing it. We just want to remove that variation from the total sum of squares and say, OK, every time we rerun this experiment, the measurements are a little bit different. There's going to be some variation in there. We're just going to remove it and sort of get rid of it. So that's going to be our first table here. This is variation from each replication. Um, then we get to the whole plot and the whole plot is going to have an A sum of squares with its degrees of freedom and it's going to have a, a whole plot, an whole plot, a whole plot, <laughs> I 
a whole plot, um, air sum of squares. Um, and in this case, the degrees of freedom are going to correspond to alpha tau, which is going to be Ka minus 1, N minus 1. And we're going to get an F statistic out that's going to look something like um, SSA divided by its degrees of freedom, all divided by SS air whole divided by its degrees of freedom. All right, so we have that. Um, and then we're going to have, this is the whole plot. And then we're going to have the subplot, which is going to be another table in our design, another subtable in our grander ANOVA table. In this case, we're going to have SSB, SSA cross B, the sum of squares for the interaction term. And we're going to have the um, air sum of squares for the subplot. And in this case, the degrees of freedom are just going to be KB minus 1, KA minus 1, KB minus 1. And lastly, we're going to have now KA. You can get this from summing up those two things in the green box at the top of the screen. It's going to be KA, KB minus 1, uh, n minus 1. And then F tests. <laughs> the F statistics are going to be exactly what you think they're going to be. It's just going to be the sum of squares that we want to test divided by the subplot sum of squares um, divided by their respective degrees of freedom. So there's nothing sort of new or profound there, um, right? Something like SSB divided by the degrees of freedom for B and SS sub divided by the degrees of freedom for sub. Um, so yeah, besides the fact that uh, we have now, in some sense, three different ANOVA tables to worry about um, or sub tables within our ANOVA table, um, we can proceed the same way. We look at the F statistics, we get a P value out, we determine whether or not they're significant. If they are significant, we can do a post hoc Tukey test, et cetera, et cetera. So again, let's take a very quick break and then I'm going to do an example. And yeah, this one actually shows up in, uh, in R. So um, yeah, let's do that in R um, rather than writing more stuff into a uh, one note here. And we're back and now we're in our studio yet again. Um, and we're going to look in this Agridat library or package, I should say, that I have already loaded in. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the stroop.splitplot data set. So this is just simulated split plot data. But uh, luckily it was already done for us, so I don't have to simulate my own split plot data. Now, let's look a little bit at what this data is. So first, well, let's just look at the data. And what do we see? Well, okay, we have a couple things here. We have our response column Y. We have our replications. It looks like one, two, three, and four. We have a factor B, which I believe is the subplot here. Yeah, B is at the subplot, just like in the notes that I presented um, with two levels. A is at the whole plot with three levels. So Again, when we first look at this data, if I didn't tell you how it was collected, you might think it's just a two-way ANOVA problem, um, right? I mean, if I, if I just look at the columns, there's nothing telling me here how it was collected or how it was randomized. Um, and that's where you have to be very careful when you're dealing with such um, data, because it doesn't just matter what the data table looks like, it matters how the data was collected. And that's really a key and subtle point um, in design of experiments. Because a lot of times you just go online, right? And you download some giant data set, throw some machine learning stuff at it and see what happens. But here we really have to know like, okay, how was this data actually collected? How was the experiment run? Because it's gonna make a difference as to how we um, analyze it in an ANOVA table. So the first thing I was doing in my notes was in some sense doing it the wrong way. Um, 
The wrong way is to do it as a two-way ANOVA problem. So if I were to just say, let's say model, I'm going to call it model.wrong. If I say AOV um, is going to be, let's say Y, the output, um, and then let's just say A times B, and then ignore the replications um, as we might in um, just two-way ANOVA. We could include the replications if we really wanted to, but um, uh, you know what? Actually, no, no, this will be fine. None of those, they're all going to be treated as factors, so we should be good. So what I can do is I can run this and I can say, hey, look, it works as a two-way ANOVA, but it's not what we actually want to do. Here, actually, it's quite interesting. There is no detected significance um, when I analyze the data incorrectly. Um, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Sometimes you might have some erroneous false positives. I don't even want to call it a false positive because you're analyzing the data wrong, but you may have some erroneous um, results. Now, what they might say if you're doing two-way ANOVA, we're going to call this um, MD wrong two. There's another wrong way to analyze this data, um, and that would be, but let's say slightly better in the sense that what we could do is I could include the replication as a random effect. So by typing in air rep into my equation here at the bottom of the screen, what I'm basically saying, let's slide this over and get a little bit more room here in case the equation is just going to get bigger. Um, right. So what I'm saying here is take the replication factor and treat it as a random effect. The idea being that if I were to have replicated this experiment, say I think four different times, each time the measurements I get out are going to be slightly different. And what we can do is we can take that variation due to replications and throw it out in some sense. Um, so when I do that and I look at my new ANOVA table, what I get is, ah, I actually detected some significance. Now, again, this is the wrong way to analyze this data, but I'm just trying to show you how we can, what it does. When I include the error as a, or as, sorry, when I include the replication factor as a random effect, what it does is it takes it into its own table here. So now inside my summary, I actually have two tables. I have the replication effect, which it has been removed, including its three degrees of freedom and its very large sum of squares has been removed from the residuals. So if you notice, A, B, and A times B sum of squares have not changed at all here. It's still the same three values, but the residuals have changed a lot. 18 was reduced by 3 to 15, and those three degrees of freedom are now sitting up here with my replications. But more significantly, this very large sum of squares for the residuals initially, um, most of that actually comes from the replication error. So even though this is simulated data that doesn't actually um, exist, it didn't come from a real experiment, what this is telling us is that whenever, if this actually were a real experiment, that there was a lot of changes from replication one to two to three to four. Um, and we can remove all that variation in order to have a better chance at detecting significance in factors A and B. So if we were to do a two-way ANOVA and take the replication as a random error, this is how we would analyze the data. But that's not the way it should be analyzed because, again, it's a split plot. The split plot says that I actually have to test A and then test B and the interaction term in separate uh, with separate residuals or with uh, separate air sum of squares. So we're going to go one step further down this rabbit hole um, and come up with a slightly new syntax. So I'm going to call this md.good in the sense that it is the uh, right way to analyze this data. And the right way is really to keep the formula the same as I had before, but we're going to put a slash a into the air term. So now, what's this telling R? It's telling R that A and B are fixed effects, That's and I want to test A, I want to test B, and I want to test the interaction term A times B. When I use the air function here, it's telling R that the replication 
is a um is a random effect that I want to sort of deal with in my um, ANOVA model. Um, but I also have A here kind of within, um, nested within the, the replication, which is perhaps a weird way to say it because, um, yeah, it's sort of, it's, yeah, it's kind of a weird, yeah, weird way to interpret it. Um, but what we're ultimately doing is we're telling R that um, that A is being randomized sort of more coarsely within with the replication, whereas the B term is not in this expression and it's being fully randomized in some sense. Um, so let's see what happens when we do that. So if I type that summary and now I get three tables, so I still have the same um, replication um, errors or, or sum of squares that's removed from everything. That doesn't change as it did from my example where I just had a, a, re a replication as a random effect. But what does change is how we analyze A and B. So here we have a table for the whole plot. Now the table for the whole plot says, ah, I have A with my A sum of squares. Notice that it's the same sum of squares from before. So the sum of squares doesn't change. What does change is the residuals because here we take our 325, which is the residual sum of squares, and we break it into two pieces. Now we have a whole plot piece and a subplot piece, and it turns out that a lot of the variance or the, the, the lot of the variation, I should say, because variance is a very specific thing, a lot of the variation in the um, residuals is showing up in the whole plot at 240, whereas 84 is showing up in the subplot. So again, the, the, the bigger this number is, the bigger the error sum of squares is, the larger the denominator will be in our F statistic and the more likely it will not be significant at some predefined level. Um, and that's kind of what we see here. So what we see here is let's say we were to pick a um, rejection threshold or a size for our test of 5% because everybody loves 5%, right? Um, well, no, everybody hates 5% except, I guess, Fisher, who probably also hated that he said, let's test at 5%, but let's test at 5% anyway. Um, if I were to analyze this data incorrectly up here, I would reject the, hypo the nulls for A and B and claim that, yes, there is some significant differences among the factors levels A, the factor levels B, but I don't see any significant interaction term here. Whereas if we analyze this data correctly as a split plot, then suddenly we would not reject A at the 5% level. Again, the p-value starting to get small, so you might if you were running this, if this was real data, it might tell you that, yeah, you know what, there might be some significance here, but it's still not a very strong p-value, and we might want to do some follow-up experiments, maybe try to randomize A some more to get a, a stronger result. But what we do have is down here, we still get a, um, a small p-value, actually an even smaller p-value, even though it's not always good to compare p-values, but here we would reject not only at the 5%, but also at like the 1% level um, for B. So B suddenly has a much larger F value than it did um, when it was tested up here um, uh, in an incorrect way. Uh, and lastly, we also see that the P value is now not reject, still not rejected at the 5% level, but the P value for the interaction term has decreased a little bit. Again, kind of hinting that maybe there is something going on there and that perhaps we should collect more data to try to get a stronger result. Um, if we analyze this incorrectly, we would get a P value of 20% and say, well, yeah, there's no interaction. That's just not... Um, anywhere close to being significant. Whereas here, we're pretty close to like some thresholds for significance. So we might think that, yeah, there could be an interaction there, but um, it could be something to do, check in a follow-up experiment.
Right. So anyway, that's roughly the idea of the um, split plot design, how to analyze it correctly, how to analyze it incorrectly in R um, and what can happen. So again, it's very, very important. The big takeaway here is it's very important to know how your data was collected so you know how to properly analyze it. In R, um, there is this error command that you can use within the AOV function, and that will tell you how to do random effects. The slash is going to be like a nesting term. Um, so there's different ways that you can analyze this data. Um, what I also wanted to say is that if you look at the uh, documentation here, we'll slide this over now. If you look at the documentation for this, they also have other functions you can use for analyzing this data. Most notably are these um, linear mixed effects models. And um, there's two different libraries for doing linear mixed effects models. And they have slightly different syntax, as you can see here. Um, and you can um, investigate that yourself. I'm not going to spend the time going through all of that because it's just more functions and it can be confusing if I start using multiple different um, R functions within the same uh, within the same lectures. So for this course, I'm going to stick with the standard AOV for fitting an analysis of variance model. Um, but the point is, is that you can have more complex settings like linear mixed effects. Um, you can have nonlinear mixed effects. You can even have some GLMs. I think there's a mixed effects GLM library somewhere in there, but um, I'm not 100% sure. There's a lot of stuff in R, which is why it's uh, great and also at the times unwieldy. Um, but, oh yeah, there's a, well, maybe, a, actually, I'm not even sure what MCMC GLMM is. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff in R. Um, but regardless, um, yeah, this is a good example of a split plot design. Now going forward, what we're going to do is we're almost done with this section of chapter in my notes. We still need to talk about analysis of covariant or ANCOVA, where we would have covariates in our model. Um, I also, and this is going a little off script, um, want to talk a little bit more about nesting because it's something that I neglected in past versions of this course and I think it's good to look at different ways that factors can be nested because the split plot is just one way that you can nest factors where you sort of have A randomized up here and B randomized down there. But sometimes you could have fixed effects that are nested one within the other um, besides just having random effects and other types of nesting in that way. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it might be a short lecture, but then I'll just follow up with jumping right into chapter three, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be multiple testing correction. We're going to roll up our sleeves, I guess, and do some, uh, some, some math with some p-values, which is always a good time. So I will see you in those lectures. And until then, uh, keep looking at the data. Yeah.